Thank you all for coming out on what is truly a beautiful Thursday afternoon, early evening. I know you all could be spending your evening at the pool or grilling out. Um, so thank you for coming to spend some time with us and hear from our guest as uh, PJ Hill from for the final installment of our free enterprise forum for this semester. Uh, the Free Enterprise Forum is, is sponsored by the Boss Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise, but this event in particular is also co-sponsored by the Department of Economics, the Department of Environmental Science, as well as the American um, Econ AEI uh, Executive Council. So thanks for our co-sponsors for helping getting the word out. Um, the Boss Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise is dedicated to uh, developing an understanding of how the free enterprise system uh, impacts businesses and entrepreneurs. We do seek to do this through three avenues, through teaching, through research, and outreach, and the free enterprise forum is one of the major aspects of our outreach program. Uh, our guest today, again, is Dr. P.J. Hill. I first met um, Dr. Hill while I was a graduate student at a um, Values and Capitalism Retreat uh, for, for young faculty, and, and Dr. Hill was the, um, the advisor there for that weekend, and it was a, a February in uh, Northern Virginia, and we got, I think we were trying to figure out maybe about a, a, a foot of snow that weekend, so we were trapped inside in this uh, uh, very uh, old house on a, out in the, in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. Um, and we had a nice fire, and we sat around for the whole weekend just uh, talking about how institutions and, and markets uh, improve kind of uh, human well-being and are important for social progress. And um, it's my honor to kind of be able to uh, introduce Dr. Hill today. He is a, uh, holds a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. He is uh, emeritus professor of economics from Wheaton College one of the uh, top liberal, Christian liberal arts colleges uh, in the country. He also is a research fellow with Perk in Bozeman, Montana, where he grew up and uh, until relatively recently was a, also in addition to being an economist, a ranch, uh, a ranch farmer. And he's written um, just scores of, of articles for um, peer-reviewed journals, uh, popular press, as well as three books. Uh, to, Three of them with uh, his partner in crime, Terry Anderson, um, The Not-So-Wild West, Property Rights on the Frontier, The Birth of a Transfer Society, and Growth and Welfare in the American Past. And this past book was also um, co-authored with the late Nobel uh, Prize winner, Douglas North. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Hill. Thank you, Daniel. It's a delight to be here. Uh, that weekend we spent marooned or snowed in on the, uh, in the Virginia campus, uh, not on a campus, but at a retreat center. Um, it was pretty minor. Uh, I finished my graduate work, met my wife at a lecture of Milton Friedman's, my last uh, year of graduate work. Uh, took her back to a ranch in eastern Montana, so that's where we're gonna spend the rest of our lives. Uh, we didn't do that. I actually gradually uh, morphed into a part-time academic and then a full-time academic. But the first winter, we were snowbound for six weeks. So the weekend, uh, um, from about 75 miles from town, so uh, the, the weekend in Virginia was uh, pretty mild. So I'm talking about environmental issues. I'm going to approach it through a particular perspective. Uh, we've called it saving the environment through property rights and prices. Another way of thinking about it is to call it free market environmentalism. That's a term that's sometimes used to think about this particular issue. What it really does is to think about what are the incentives and the information that we have with respect to environmental and resource issues. And if we don't get the incentives right, and if we don't generate decent information, it's going to be more difficult to deal uh, with those sorts of issues. Uh, this does try to use decentralized information property rights, prices basically, a price is a price for a property right. 
either to get permanent possession of it or to rent it or, uh, or to have a portion of it. So all of those sorts of things are related to prices. And so we think about it through, when I say we, it's a group of people that do research and publish in these sorts of areas, many of them associated with this little center in Montana that now gives me an office and doesn't require much more out of me. This is in particular a contrast to the usual approach, uh, sometimes by economists, oftentimes by non-economists, as we think about environmental issues, the usual approach is, well, we identify a problem, we call it market failure, and then we assume there is a solution called government. Well, uh, there, we can debate a lot about whether this is uh, market failure or not. I'm gonna say it's an institutional failure. The, one of the things about this particular approach uh, in contrast to the command and control top-down approach uh, is that it is much more dynamic. You have a center for entrepreneurship here, and entrepreneurship thinks about being able to recognize and respond to changes, uh, needs in the economy. And this sort of an approach is much more dynamic than your command and control approaches because you, you've decentralized the information and you've just decentralized the places of control. So that means that you can get responses uh, more rapidly. That's pretty useful in the environmental area because one of the things that's happening over time is people change their demand, particularly for what we would call environmental amenities, for some of the goodies that flow from the environment. Um, turns out that recreational opportunities, use of water, uh, use of other sorts of resources changes. Also our knowledge changes, our scientific basis changes. We need to be in a position where we can respond to those particular sorts of changes. And I would argue that this sort of a response is a, um, or this sort of an institutional arrangement is going to give you the opportunity to respond uh, more appropriately, much more nuanced, much more uh, situation specific, uh, much, with much more respect to what's called the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. That's a quote from F.A. Hayek. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk, I'll briefly talk a little bit about the different ways of looking at the environment. Uh, how can we approach the environment, uh, environmental issues? You can be a biocentric, you can be uh, anthropocentric, you can be theocentric. Biocentrism is also called deep ecology. Uh, that says that everything is of equal worth. There's no particular way of distinguishing between uh, any different parts of the natural world. They're all equal. You might not want to go hiking with David Foreman, one of the interesting spokespeople for the environmental issue. He's serious about this. I and mean, he says, if he's hiking with you and he's carrying a sidearm, and a grizzly bear attacks you, he has no moral basis for deciding whether to shoot the grizzly bear or to shoot you. Why? You're both morally equal. Now maybe you spent enough time with David, he would consider you a better friend than, his, uh, than, the, than the grizzly bear, but there's no particular, um, no particular reason to choose one over the other, and that's the biocentric sort of approach. Many people would take anthropocentric sort of an approach uh, which says humans are the, are the central or most significant species on the planet. Part of the anthropocentric approach does say that nature has no intrinsic worth unless people value it. I'm gonna argue for, a, I'm gonna be operating from a theocentric approach, even if you don't think that's the right approach, I would argue from a prudential perspective, many of these sorts of proposals that I, I would be willing to defend them just prudentially, uh, if not theologically. But anthropocentrism, basically says that God is central to our existence, um, that creation has worth, both because we value it, but because God created it. It has value for those sorts of reasons. Um, the, uh, another important aspect of, of a theocentric view is, a, is the um, idea that there's a distinction between the created and the creator. Some pantheistic views would say, well, yes, there's some sort of transcendence, but it's all a part of nature, too. Uh, that is not a, not, does not fit with the, uh, with the particular perspective that I'm arguing for. Um, my perspective would say that we are made in the image of God. We've been given particular responsibilities, uh, moral responsibilities to steward and care for creation. Now, one of, I think one of the fascinating things 
is for many environmentalists who operate, not all, not all environmentalists are operating from a biocentric sort of a perspective, but quite a few are. And one of the fascinating things that I have in terms of working with them is they almost always are calling upon humans who are completely equal to all other species from their perspective to take moral actions. Their appeals are for moral responsibility on the part of humans. But why not call on the part of grizzly bears to be morally responsible? Or why not call on crested wheatgrass to be morally responsible? Because they're all equal. So anyway, at least I have a basis for arguing for our moral research about responsibilities. Now, part of the environmental movement does see, you remember on that quote from David Foreman, uh, he said that humans really are the cancer of the earth or the curse of the earth. And even if you don't go that far, if you don't go with a deep ecology view, there still is the perspective that the problem is that we humans have really messed things up. We have stepped in, and there is a balance of nature. Things are in equilibrium. And if we, if we just get humans out of the way, then we can return nature to its particular point of balance of equilibrium. It's always moving towards that unless something interferes with it. Well, interestingly enough, uh, recent work by a whole group of biologists, uh, you know, e ecologists, have s are arguing against that. And they're presenting what I find to be fairly convincing evidence. This is not from a Christian perspective, but it does come from respectable sorts of scientists. Uh, Daniel Botkin, uh, The Moon and the Nautilus Shell, he has a previous book before that. Emma Morris, um, Rambunctious Gardens. Both argue, first of all, you cannot find a part of nature that has not been impacted by humans. The argument is that humans are very much a part of the natural world, not even if you don't take a theocentric sort of a view, and that we should just accept that fact and move on. And if we try to get out, you know, if we just try to step back and get out of the environment, it doesn't return. It's dynamic. It's going on. There's no particular balance place that it's going to be uh, moving to. So. The core of free market environmentalism is basically a property rights perspective that says, and I will try to make this clearer as we go through, why all environmental issues are property rights issues. We see it through the property rights lens. Uh, and whenever anybody's raising an environmental issue, a pollution issue, a uh, use of a resource issue, it's really a claim that conflicts with other people's claims. If it didn't conflict, then it's not a particular issue. I mean, there's not particularly a conflicting claim with regard to Daniel's shoes. He thinks he owns them, and most people aren't arguing with him about that. There he may want, some people may be arguing with him when he drives his automobile back to Dallas this evening in terms of the affluent from his tailpipe, saying, no, you don't have the right to put your affluent into my airspace. But on the other hand, it would appear, at least legally, that he does have that sort of a right. So that's a conflicting claim over property rights. So then how do we think about that? We think about trying to clarify the property rights so we can move to a peaceful resolution over those sorts of issues. Now, most economists think about environmental issues through what we call externality concepts, and we talk about an environmental problem as an externality problem. This isn't a long ways from that, but it is different because when you make the externality claim, you are claiming you already know who owns what property right. So that's a step farther, and sometimes you, sometimes you don't know exactly who owns it, and you need to try to clarify who actually has that sort of a property right. And sometimes those are interesting sorts of issues. For instance, uh, take up, uh, by the way, this is based upon the work of Ronald, I'm a, I'm a Coasean following the work of Ronald Coase, who talks about the reciprocal nature of harms, and this is very much in the Coase framework for those of you that aren't economists or econ majors, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, but take the, instance for, uh, the case, for instance, of new technology, drone technology. You can now go make or purchase a drone. Uh, you can take it outside of town, and you can fly it. When you fly it over a farmer's field at 100 feet above the ground, are you violating his or her rights? Does she have the right to tell you you can't fly your drone? And you'd say, no, look, I have the right to fly my drone in this particular area. The farmer may say, no, you don't have your right to, to, to fly your drone over that area. That's a conflicting claim. And so then you have to think about how do we resolve that claim? And you can assign rights to one group, you can assign them to the other. One of the nice things is if you assign them and make them transferable, and the farmer has the right to keep you out, you can go out and say to the farmer, look, I want to fly my drone. Pay you $20 for an afternoon of drone climbing. And he says, oh, don't get them close enough to my dairy cows to spook them. You agree to do that, so there's no, no particular problem. 
On the other hand, if you have the right and the farmer sees you out there, he can go out and say, I would pay you not to fly your drone over my property. So that's what we would call one of the advantages of a property rights framework. It, it encourages people how to get along. When I talk about property rights, I think about the three aspects of property rights, or what we might call the three Ds of property rights. And the three Ds are that the property rights need to be defined. We have to say where they are, we have to draw the boundaries, and we do discover that areas where definition is more problem, then we have more conflicting claims. Air and water are two areas for which the costs of defining and enforcing the rights are more expensive. Those property rights need to be defended. In other words, we need to have a mechanism for trying to solve those sorts of problems. Now, notice that free market environmentalism is not saying there is no role for government. Many times, government is an effective definer and enforcer of property rights. And so it's a very useful way to doing it. There are transaction costs to defining and defending property rights. But we have to figure out what's the least, trans what's the least cost way of doing that. And my third D, just to make the Ds work, is divestible. I'm doing a bait and switch on you here because it's really transferable, but divestible sounds better. I couldn't say the two Ds and one T of property rights, so it's the three Ds of property rights. But so they're, they're, and divestible means simply transferable. And if they're not transferable, as we will discover in certain sorts of cases, it creates all sorts of problems. They can be defined, they can be defended, uh, but they may not be divestible. They may not be transferable. So we need to think about ways of doing that. And what should the role of government be in this? Government should be a transaction cost reducer. It should be a way of trying to lower the transaction cost. Government isn't always the way to do it. Sometimes there's other means of defining and enforcing property rights. Daniel t mentioned our book that I wrote with Terry Anderson, The Not So, act actually you left out one wild. It's The Not So Wild, Wild West, uh, Property Rights on the Frontier. And there we're talking about bottom-up definition of property rights. There wasn't much government on much of the frontier, but people still figured out ways uh, to define and defend property rights. Wagon trains going across from St. Joseph, Missouri to California, um, mining claims, water rights, trailing cattle from Texas to Montana, all of those sorts of things. Um, so there, there are lots of ways you can go about doing it. If we don't have well-defined and enforced property rights, then we get what most of you probably understand something about the tragedy of the commons, which means you have over-exploitation of a resource. Straightforward way to think about this, you go out for uh, dinner this evening with 12 of your friends. You go to a pizza place. You put four large pizzas in the center of the table. And you are sitting there eating your pizza. But you are a real foodie when it comes to pizza. And you're slowly chewing on it. And you're meditating on the spices and the herbs. And you're just enjoying this pizza to no end. And you look around, and you're on your first piece. And everybody else is on their third or their fourth piece. And you think, oh my goodness. How fast should I consume my pizza? I should consume it much more rapidly than the optimal rate. And it could well be that the other people sitting at the table are doing the same thing. So you could end up with everybody consuming pizza too rapidly because you don't have well-defined and enforced property rights. Now, you may solve that problem by when the pizza comes, you draw a little, you know, take the pizza cutter and, or take your pen knife out and cut it into pieces and say, that's mine. One of the nice things about that is if you get too much pepperoni and you prefer the spinach pizza and goat cheese pizza, pizza you may be able to trade it with somebody else. The other sort of a thing, what happens, of course, is you don't go in groups of 15 or 20, you go in groups of six or seven, and you use some peer group pressure to try to solve the problem of overconsumption of the resource. So I don't consider pizza overconsumption of, of pizza. I consider bottom-up forces for limiting the consumption of pizza working pretty well. However, this is Bakersfield, California, 1931. What are those things? Those were oil wells. Why are there so many of those oil wells? I haven't tried to really get an accurate count on them. There's at least 15 or 20 oil wells in view there, probably more outside of the camera view. Why all these oil wells just so close together? Well, and oil is a common pool resource. Now, it's not quite like there's just this big pool of oil underneath the ground and you just stick oil wells in it. And you, and you pump it out, what you do is you create a pressure, a pressure gradient and oil will flow out of the oil-bearing shale. But nevertheless, a lot of the oil is coming out of the same place. So people put all these oil wells down. It's an overuse of capital. You will actually overexploit the field. And actually, you'll get less oil out of the field if you, if you pump too rapidly because you, take, you, you reduce the pressure so much. So it would be more, make more sense to have two or three wells in that sort of an issue. 
We've actually solved that oil well problem reasonably well with some things called unitization, some ways of defining and enforcing property rights, but we still have common pool problems in all sorts of areas. We have them in fisheries, open access fisheries on the high seas. Uh, you may look at fish and you'd say, these fish are really valuable, but they're gonna be more valuable in three years. So I'm not gonna take them because I wanna wait for them to mature and then I'll take a portion of them now and I'll take another portion in three years. What assurance do you have that they're gonna be there? None particularly. And so you may overfish, and we do discover that in fisheries, the world fish catch has been going down because of over-exploitation of fish. Um, the atmosphere, in terms of kind of a negative common pool, you may be able to use the atmosphere to uh, uh, overuse a particular, uh, you know, as, as a sink to get rid of your stuff. We can think about property rights solutions, and there's some pretty effective ones with regard to fisheries. With fisheries, what we need to do is create a property right. And the property right is what's called a total allowable catch, uh, an individual transferable quota. Sometimes it's expressed as an individual fishing quota. That quota is usually expressed in percentage terms. So you need to have some good science. You need to have some science that tells you what's the sustainable yield from a particular fishery. And so you get the fish biologists out there and every year they look at this particular fishery and they tell you, you know, 10 million pounds. Your property right is a property right to a percentage of that catch. So it might vary from year to year, but it is a sustainable catch. Your property right is transferable. Somebody else can use it better, they can buy it out. If you want to get into that fishery, you can purchase that sort of a right. Now this came about when we extended the continental limits from three miles to 200 miles. Anybody know why it originally for a long time was three miles was what you own from the edge of your country out into the sea? Three mile was the distance that a cannon could shoot from a ship. And so for a long time they said, you know, you, shouldn't, you should be able to defend, nobody can be within your three mile limit. Well, they've now extended it uh, to 200 miles. Uh, it's called the exclusive economic zone. Within that, it basically, a country has property rights, and it can then reassign those sorts of property rights. And this is what's happening. This is a government action with respect to those particular property rights. There are some island nations for which those things overlap, and you've got to have sign some treaties and try to figure out exactly how you're going to work that out. But that has worked out pretty well uh, to trying to deal with that particular issue. People were aware of the, of the overfishing problem for a long period of time before. They knew the fish catch was going down. They knew they were overexploiting it. Uh, so the government tried to, for instance, um, in uh, particular Alaskan fisheries, they tried to regulate that. And they said, we'll regulate it by regulating the amount of inputs, usually fishing days. So they started with, you can't fish the Alaska halibut fishery longer than six months out of the year. Well, people went out and fished a lot in that six months, so they cut it to one month. You only fish for one month, what do you do? You get a bigger boat, you hire more crew, you get out there longer. Then they cut it to two weeks, and then finally it got down to two to three days of fishing per year that you could fish the halibut, uh, the halibut stock off of, Africa, uh, off of Alaska. What do you do when you only got two to three days? You rush out there, you have as large a boat as you can, you fish for 24 hours a day. Uh, suppose it's stormy, it's icy, you still fish. Very high uh, mortality on those sorts of fishing boats. Um, it, what do you think happens to the fresh halibut market? Most of it ends up at the cannery. Most of it ends up uh, being processed because for two to three days, you cannot, um, you, you know, most of it doesn't end up into the fresh fish market. Some other interesting sorts of things that happened out of that was, uh, halibut fishing is long line fishing where you take this big cable or rope and there's hooks, big hooks uh, attached at fairly regular distances and you bait it and you put it out and you may have two or three long lines off of your boat. Suppose you've got a two day fishing period and one of your lines gets all tangled up. What do you do? Take out an ax and start chopping. You let that line go. You clearly don't have time to pull it in and try to untangle it. What that meant was not only were you fishing very rapidly, not only were you using too much capital equipment, and not only was the fish not, were the fish not going to f the fresh fish market, but you ended up with a lot of what we call ghost lines that were just floating around and fish were getting caught on them and never even entered into the market. The halibut fishery now uh, is eight months long in Alaska. People have quotas. Those quotas are transferable. They've gone to smaller boats. They fish during good weather rather than during bad weather. Um, 
by 2000, but recently the last data I've said is about 15% of the world fish catch is now under some form of ITQs. New Zealand was the first country to try to use effective ITQs. Iceland, Australia, Canada, Chile, Greenland, and Holland are all countries that have tried to use ITQs. It is a property right. It's not, it's not like a property right in land, but that's an effective way to get both incentives and information in the hands of people on the ground that could use them. Let's take another issue, water shortages. Now, for the economists in the room, this raises all sorts of issues because we keep thinking shortages, shortages. But we don't have shortages in long-term uh, in, in functioning sorts of markets. I mean, I doubt if Peter Klein woke up this morning and said, I think there's going to be a cupcake shortage in Waco, Texas. You know, it's a terrible sort of a problem. There's going to be a cupcake shortage. Why isn't Peter worried about that? Well, maybe Peter just doesn't worry about cupcake shortages. But people don't think about shortages being this huge. Well, we keep talking about water shortages. I mean, anytime you talk about water, people are talking about a shortage of water. And so uh, why is that? Uh, it means that you don't have transferable property rights uh, and you're not using an appropriate sort of a price mechanism. So what it means is you get all sorts of efforts, well-meaning but misdirected and very expensive sorts of efforts to try to control water consumption. You can only water on certain days during the summertime, you know, you can only water during certain periods of time or certain, uh, certain days of the week. Uh, you can't use water for two particular purposes. You can't wash your car. You can't fill your swimming pool in uh, where, where there's a shortage of water. It's like using a 20-pound sledge to try to kill an ad. It's a very uh, inappropriate sort of a mechanism to try to deal with a problem that could be dealt with fairly straightforwardly with prices. And you get some all sorts of interesting regulations. In 1992, Congress passed the Energy Policy Act and the energy part of the Energy Policy Act has to do with toilets. You cannot legally have a toilet. You can't sell a toilet. If you've got one that's more than 40 years old, you can still have it. Uh, the water police aren't going to come take it out. But every toilet that has been sold since 1992 has to flush with less than 1.6 gallons of water or less. Average flushing before that was 3.5 to 4 gallons per water of water. I, along with my son, have installed two very modern low-flush toilets in our home. Uh, it's because our earlier low-flush toilets were not very effective low-flush toilets, so they actually didn't save that much water in that you were continually trying to flush them. Um, so every time we flush the toilet, we're saving two gallons of water. That's very nice. I live out in the country. I have a well. My wife loves flowers. We've got a substantial sort of things we water out of our well. So we're saving two to five gallons of water, maybe even on some days, 10 gallons of water a day, and we're putting 200 to 500 gallons of water on our flowers. And it's just, you know, why, why do we need to have a low flush toilet? Well, you end up with those sorts of regulations. A price mechanism lets people respond individually to how they think about those sorts of issues. So water shortages basically imply, one of the reasons people think about it is well, because water is so vital there are just no substitutes. And I think, well, water so vital. And that's why they say you can't price it because it's such a basic need. Well, I look at water and say it's such a basic need. We darn well better price it. You know, and we need it. However, are there substitutes? Well, people are consuming average water consumption in the U.S. is about 98 gallons per day. What's that mean for most people? Uh, it means that um, you, uh, there's lots of substitutes. You need about a gallon to survive. Uh, 13, day, 13 gallons a day is what you need kind of for normal living. One of the things to remember is that water is a replenishable resource. There is a hydrological cycle. So the amount of water today is the same as what it was 10 years ago, which is the same as it was 20 years ago, maybe in the wrong form, in the wrong place. But one of the thing that, things that pricing does is get it in the right place and get it to the people that uh, would need it. What about poor people uh, with regard to price? Well, suppose you doubled the price, you double it from one cent a gallon to two cents a gallon. Maybe there are people that are going to be really constrained by pricing water. If that's really the case, you can go with what we call block pricing. You know, you can charge a very low price for the certain amount of water per day or per week. Now, it does mean you're going to have to engage in metering. Uh, you're going to have to be charged people for it. And presently, many users are not charged by quantity of use. There will be an increased transaction cost. You've got to figure out what people what people are using, uh, and, then you, and then you charge for it. So where's the water going to come from? 
a lot of it's going to come from agriculture. 80% of the water in agriculture in California is going to agriculture. It's going through irrigation sorts of systems. Uh, to give you an idea of um, you know, uh, what that looks like. Um, so, uh, and why do we get what we do with regard to water? Well, a lot of the water that is used in irrigation comes from Bureau of Reclamation systems. And Bureau of Rec water, by law, cannot be transferred out of agriculture. You get it if you're a farmer, but you can't transfer it. They're act they've actually passed specific legislation for a few Bureau of Rec projects that allows the water to be transferred. Most farmers are paying about $20 an acre foot for that water. Uh, estimates, depending on the crop, is that it's worth between $50 and $200 an acre foot. An acre foot of water is the amount of water to cover one acre of ground one foot deep. That's a lot of water. If you look at municipalities, they're certainly willing to pay two to $5,000 an acre foot for water. Um, some out municipalities in California are pr presently paying ten to $12,000 an acre foot. And the highest prices I've seen I think is for Reno, Nevada, and they paid $18,000 an acre foot. But suppose it's $5,000 an acre foot, and it's worth $100 an acre foot in agriculture. You know? Suppose that you've got an old beater of a car, and it's worth $300 to you, but it's worth $3,000 to somebody else. What's going to happen to the car? It's going to get transferred to the person that values it the most. So you have water with very low valued use. Now remember, prices are on the margin. So one of the questions is, will all the water get moved out of agriculture and there won't be any crops raised? No, farmers will substitute. They'll use more drip irrigation. They may irrigate at night when there's not as much evaporation. They may change their crops. They may actually fallow some sorts of land. And the users, if they face prices, will think about, do I want a low flush toilet? Uh, do I want to take a little shorter shower? Uh, do I want to think about using gray water, recycled water, for particular sorts of uses? It's just really hard to specify all of the actions that people would take with respect to water, both using it and supplying it from the top down. I mean, there's just going to be all sorts of solutions that we don't think about that people on the ground uh, would think about. It is interesting if you transferred uh, California water. How much water would it take? Well, if you took only 4% of the water out of agriculture, you'd increase the amount of water that's presently used for other things by 50%. There's all, I've been talking about surface water. There is also groundwater, and groundwater is um, under the ground sorts of water, aquifers. There's also a problem there, and it is a common pool problem, like the oil well problem that I was talking about, because you can pump water, generally, in most areas, out from underground aquifers without any sort of a constraint. And so that means, then, that people may overuse it because they're not forced with a price. And the, uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, major underground uh, storage of water throughout the Great Plains, actually cuts down into northern Texas, doesn't come down this far. But the Ogallala Aquifer has been dropping uh, over the last several decades, particularly since 1950s when they started using irrigation out of the aquifer. Uh, straightforwardly, how would you solve that sort of a problem? You establish rights to the water. Now, you'd have to meter it. You'd have to put on some sort of a measurement device. Vernon Smith, the Nobel Prize winner in, e in, e in economics, has got a very nice proposal of how you could have both a, a stock right and a flow right to the stock that's there and a flow right a particular year. You'd make it transferable. So there is a very straightforward way. It involves some transaction costs of measuring those sorts of rights. Uh, but you can then you can solve that sort of a problem. By the way, there's a, not just an underground aquifers that over exploit, exploitation of those, but actually in some coastal areas you're getting saltwater intrusion into wells, and again that's because of over exploitation of the resource. Okay, I've been talking about uh, some of the nice things we like, uh, like water and fish. What about some of the things we might not like so well? Here's atrazine. And atrazine is a broadleaf herbicide. It's used uh, on corn and sugar cane, especially in the Midwest. It is actually the most commonly detected herbicide in groundwater in people's wells. The uh, European Union actually banned it in 2004. And that's, again, what you think of as a command and control regulation. We find some bad things around. Uh, we don't like them, and we say, let's just get rid of them, make them illegal. Well, let me propose to you a different solution. I'll introduce you to Joe Farmer there. You can wave at Joe. He's waving back at you. Joe is a corn farmer in Wisconsin. 
So Joe uses atrazine. So he goes into his local farm supply store. Eric Sparr, the owner of the store, is behind the counter. He says, hello, Joe, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Joe says, yeah, I came in for my five gallons of atrazine. Five gallons will do a lot of corn because you mix it with water and you put it on with a boom sprayer. And so uh, Joe grabs his five gallons of atrazine off the shelf, puts it up on the counter, uh, gets ready to pay for it. And Eric says, fine. You know, Joe, we now have a new regulation concerning atrazine in the state of Wisconsin. I am obligated by law to put a unique tracer into your atrazine. Now, I know in some parts of the states it's going to be a radioactive isotope. We're using a particular uh, chemical formulation, and it's unique to your atrazine. Nobody else is going to have it. And you know what, Joe? I have to take that, this list of, um, uh, of, at of, of people who have uh, uh, the registration system, and I have to send it in to Madison, to the state capital. It's going to be registered. Uh, because this is going to be your particular atrazine. Well, Joe's a freedom-loving guy, and he gets all bent out of shape, and he says to Mr. Spar, how can you be doing this? This is my, you know, it's a free country. I should be able to use my atrazine as I want to use my atrazine. And Mr. Spar is a pretty wise person, and he says, well, I know, Joe. I know this is really a problem, and it's really going to change your life in all of these sorts of ways. But remember two years ago when you were sitting at the coffee shop, and somebody sideswiped your 1983 Ford F-250 pickup, and a lady was out front, and she saw the license plate on the pickup, and she ran in and told you, and you called the sheriff, and the sheriff arrested that guy. That's kind of the system we're talking about. Now, I know it's a restriction on your freedom, Joe, to have these little metal plates on the back and the front of your vehicles, but that also means that when you harm somebody else's property, you're being held responsible. And that's what this atrazine regulation is. Sure, it's a, re it's a restriction on you, but it's an advancement in terms of keeping you from harming other people. Well, it turns out that Joe understands something about the use of atrazine, and he also knows that if you apply atrazine appropriately, if you don't apply it just before a rainstorm, and so now he watches the weather forecast a lot, and if you put it on the riparian areas, the stream bank areas, you really don't have much problem in terms of, of uh, of, of issues with regard to atrazine and groundwater. So, but suppose it does end up there. What do we do about it? Well, this is uh, Joe's pickup that got sideswiped uh, there. Um, but what we would do then is we would go to the common law. And we, would, we don't need new regulations. The common law, which in the US is a common law country, Louisiana is the only part that's not common law. Since 1600, there have been the, the doctrines of trespass and nuisance. They started with regard to odor from a pig farm. They say, if you can show harm and you can identify the person that harmed you, you can get damages. And if it's bad enough, you can actually get an injunction to stop these sorts of measures from happening. Actually, pulp mills in Wisconsin in 1905 were paying a lot of attention to what might happen to their affluent downstream, because they knew they could be sued under common law. And so they actually bought up portions of streams for their pulp mills. And you also end up with a situation for what we call a Kosian exchange. Is it better to go ahead and pollute and pay for it, or is it better to not to stop doing it so you end up with kind of transferable uh, sorts of property rights? So you don't need other sorts of things. And once you have the common law, people think long and hard about, you know, should I do these sorts of things? Remember, we get all sorts of what you would call pollution problems that are solved because they're a part of contract. I'm looking at a row of professors here sitting in the front, and guess what? Baylor pollutes their leisure time immensely. It takes over their leisure time, pours all sorts of things into it. The responsibility to show up in classes and hold office hours and write research papers. We don't think about that as an environmental problem because there's a contract. You've agreed to have your, your leisure time used up. And so if you have property rights, then what you do is it encourages people to look. They look for ways of getting along. You get these agreeable sorts of solutions in which, sure, would your professors might like to have more leisure time. Now, I know they're entirely motivated by just the desire to serve you, but they might, on the margin, take some more leisure time. But Baylor has purchased it. You have purchased it by virtue of your contract with Baylor. And so we don't worry a lot about pollution of professors' leisure time by imposing upon costs upon them because we say, that's, what, that's how we work with markets. So what we're trying to create here is a situation that comes somewhat close to that. Okay, another situation, wildlife. Um, 
Wildlife in almost all areas, and interestingly enough, Texas is the exception to that. You have a you have very different rule here. But in all states except for Texas, uh, and to a certain extent in Texas, but you have much more uh, entrepreneurial ownership of game. Uh, but in almost in all the other states, the state owns the wild game. Now it sounds like it's okay. Well, we have hunting quotas, we have those sorts of things. They are a migratory resource. Uh, uh, and, but you might, may want to try to save them. In most countries of the world, the, uh, the state owns the wild game. So here we have a herd of elephants. Let's say we like elephants. We'd like to preserve them. We think they're a you know, ni nice part of the ecosystem. We would actually, you know, maybe you want to go on a, on a photo safari and um, you know, take pictures of elephants. Maybe you'd like to go shoot one. Uh, so you see them as great creatures. There are some people in Africa, namely uh, subsistence farmers, that think of them more as giant rats. They come in and they consume your crops and they do all sorts of, of damage. So what are you going to do about it? Well, there have been a, we've got some interesting experiments with that. Kenya decided we uh, want to conserve the elephants. So they banned all legal hunting of elephants in Kenya. And this is going to really work. We're going to tell people they can't hunt elephants. The people on the ground didn't have much reason to prevent poaching. They were the people that were there. As far as they were concerned, getting rid of some of the elephants was actually a pretty good idea. Contrast that with Zimbabwe. Uh, there was something called campfire in Zimbabwe. I wonder what the, who the bureaucrat was that sat in the office for a while and tried to make that acronym work because campfire is the Communal Areas Management Program for Indigenous Resources. Uh, what that did was to give kind of rights, quasi-property rights to elephants, to the local villages. Uh, they could grant you the right to hunt the elephants. They could grant you the right to take pictures of the elephants. They could actually kill an elephant if they thought it was a marauding bull that they wanted to get rid of. And they had a very strong reason to try to control poachers because this was their resource. And they were the people on the ground. They also carried guns and used those against poachers. But so anyway, the, you give those sorts of property rights. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at what happened in Zimbabwe, in a country where they allowed people to take elephants, the elephant population went from, from 85,000, 37,000 to 85,000 by 2006. Unfortunately, under Mugabe, the program collapsed. So it no longer uh, exists. But Camp Fire generated about $20 million uh, for about 90,000 households. Their income increased by about 20% during this period of time. Uh, similar sort of a thing in Nam Namibia. Uh, where they gave villages, they called them conservancies, and a very large proportion of the population, of the, of the local population, has decided to be a part of a conservancy. In that conservancy, the local people control the elephants, the hippos, and the crocodiles. They make trade-offs. Uh, how many of them do we want? Which ones are preying upon the other sorts of ones? Uh, it is interesting to think about what happened in Kenya, where they were bound and determined not to allow any property rights to be taken. In Kenya, the elephant population basically collapsed from 167,000 to 32,000. Remember, one of the things that property rights do is extend people's horizons. They make them think longer into the future. When we talk about wildlife, one of the concerns is maybe it becomes more valuable, that the tusks have become too valuable for uh, use in, uh, you know, for ivory. Uh, for carving ivory with uh, rhinos. The rhino horn is seen as an aphrodisiac in some parts of Asia. And so as it becomes more valuable, people worry about, oh, that's going to really cause the over-exploitation of the resource. Well, not if you have property rights. I've been in ranching most of my life, and I've gone through all sorts of beef cycles. Sometimes the cattle price of cattle is high, and sometimes it's low. Guess what? When the price of cattle is high, do I run out and shoot all my Angus cows because I want to ship them to market? Well, I ship some of them to market. But I darn well kept a bunch of them around so I could produce more Angus cows. Chicken became a more popular meat in the 70s and 80s as people tried to move away from red meat consumption. We have this big concern we're going to run out of leghorn chickens because chicken has become so valuable. Guess what? People kept a lot of leghorn chickens. Property rights cause you to do two things, think longer into the future and think more about what other people want. Even if you don't want something, they may well uh, want it. Okay. Last issue, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, what about the elephant in the room? If I'm so, so smart about all of this, what would I do about global climate change? And I'm not going to do much on the science. I would say that it does appear to me to be an issue. 
Uh, humans are involved with it, and we do need to think seriously about, about, about the problem. Um, it is a property rights problem. It is a harm uh, to people, uh, you know, in terms of if it is going on, and I do think it is going on, question, a lot of questions about what's that, what's the risk parameter, how big are the risks, what's, you know, uh, what do we think about, how soon do those risks become, uh, become real in terms of changing uh, settlement patterns. Uh, but transboundary issues certainly are the most difficult ones to solve. They're somewhat of a problem when you're crossing state lines. They're really a problem when you're cover, uh, uh, crossing uh, lines. Here's how I would think about the solutions. One would be what we would call technology inducement prizes. Some things we would like more of, but they are kind of what economists call public good aspects, like knowledge. It's very difficult to keep people from uh, having access to knowledge that is valuable. So for instance, one of the problems is if we use uh, carbon-free energy production, particularly wind uh, and solar, it'll, the energy will be produced in times when there's not, we don't want it as much. So it would be really nice to be able to store energy. Some of, and, and with other sorts of energy sources too. You, you know, when you get a coal fire generating plant up and running, it's very difficult to shut it down. So you may run it through the early morning hours when nobody's particularly using the energy. So more energy storage would be very helpful. Battery technology is not doing a great job. It's improving somewhat. You could offer a $5 million prize for somebody that can or a $10 million prize. For, and you'd have certain sorts of measures to try to do that. So there are some ways we can think about technology. We can think about adaptation. And we are adapting right now. Uh, and they would, if uh, climate change uh, is a serious problem and goes on, there will be adaptation. People will move. Crops will be raised in different places. People will change their, how they live, their housing sorts of patterns. Uh, one of the things to, as we think about adaptation um, to climate change is we certainly need to quit subsidizing people doing things that put them in harm's way. And the federal flood insurance program certainly does that. The federal flood insurance program keeps encouraging people to live in flood-prone areas, in risky areas. We keep you know, paying them for doing that. And if you look at the data, some homes you know, have been compensated numerous times for being flooded. So one of the things to do would be to quit doing that if we care about adaptation. Mitigation is the final solution. And that one would be actually to try to reduce carbon emissions, try to get them, you know, get them to a point that would not cause uh, un, you know, uh, unwarranted global, uh, global warming or global climate change. Um, the s two solutions we think about are cap and trade and a revenue neutral carbon tax. Now, I was arguing that cap and trade and a revenue neutral carbon tax are the same. Earl Grinnells and I got in a discussion today about is that really the case or not. But cap and trade simply sets the cap on emissions. It makes it tradable. You can reduce it over time. You can either take some of those emission rights away, or you can purchase them. You can have environmental groups could lower it by raising money and doing it. You can tax the, the body politic, the, the people, to try to do, deal with those sorts of carbon emissions. A revenue neutral carbon tax um, would be putting a tax on carbon, but instead of what you're really trying to do is just change the price of putting carbon into the atmosphere. And you're not really trying to use it as a mechanism to generate more revenue. So for it to be effective, you'd want to give the money back. So you take the carbon tax, and you remand the, the tax revenues back to the population that you've taxed. Uh, now, to do it completely correctly, you should do it on the basis of your use of carbon. Wealthy people use more carbon-based tools than poor people do. Um, but it would probably be too complicated, I think, just a per capita remanding of property tax revenues. That would be somewhat progressive. Uh, I don't think that's a big problem. But you would, you would just give the money back. You'd tax a certain amount, and then you'd give it back in order to, to try to make it just a change in prices. Uh, both would limit the carbon emissions. Uh, they rely much more on in individual initiative, what we call uh, local, you know, local information to try to get there. Uh, both would remove the need for all sorts of attempts to price carbon. We presently are, we have a carbon tax. We just happen to have it in all sorts of interesting sorts of ways. We have all sorts of subsidies to wind and solar. That's basically a carbon tax or a subsidy to try to get rid of carbon. We have an ethanol mandate, has to be a certain amount of ethanol in fuels, very expensive and probably uh, more damaging to uh, the environment. There's a corporate average fuel economy uh, standards. Um, 
the, that mandate says that you know, automobiles have to meet certain sorts of standards. 29 states have renewable energy mandates that they will have a certain amount of their energy will come from renewable energy by certain sorts of dates. Some of it's being imposed now, some of it's going to be uh, imposed in the future. All of those are prices. Now they're very awkward sorts of prices, prices through regulation. And a carbon tax would say, and by the way, if you go with a carbon tax, then you get rid of those. You don't do those. One of the worst proposals is some proposals in Congress say, we'll have a carbon tax and we'll take the money and we'll subsidize green energy. That's the reason you have the carbon tax. So you can get rid of doing all of these sorts of things. These generally proposals, as we look at them, they are really, it's costing us about $100 to $600 per uh, ton of carbon that we're put into the atmosphere, trying to estimate the social cost. I see estimates of between $10 and $42 a ton of carbon. So a carbon tax would probably go with a cheaper problem away. Now, here's the problem. One of them, of course, is we're talking in a group about an agreement between sovereign nations. Uh, another is a carbon tax would generate a lot of revenue. And so the assumption is the government will just take that revenue and just turn right around and hand it back. Well, for those of you that have studied any public choice, know that sometimes when a big pot of money appears in the hands of politicians, they think that they have some better uses for it than handing it back to people. Uh, if you do a cap and trade program, you're going to have to allocate the emission rights. That may be politically fraught with all sorts of problems. And of course, the fundamental problem is setting the tax and the cap at the right level. Lots of disagreements about, okay, what would you do? If you do set it, you probably want to start out fairly low with expressed clear uh, st statements on what it would be increasing per year. You would actually develop a futures market in it, and that futures market would be a pretty good estimate of what people are thinking, not the government, what people are thinking about risks for the future. Okay. Let's finish here. Free market environmentalism. It is an approach uh, that relies on property rights and prices. It does encourage social cooperation. And it goes back to thinking about human initiative and liberty in solving environmental problems. Thank you. So Daniel's the man in charge. and. We have some time for questions. Yeah, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for me to bring the mic so we can be sure it gets captured in the uh, audio and video. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. I thought it was great. Um, so my question is about um, how to think about who owns aquifers in order to have the authority to sell. Mm -hmm. um, rights to the water right. and the aquifer. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if a government owns the aquifer, there's some like incentive problems there with who they get to sell it to. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you've thought about that and what your thoughts are on Well, basically, you would assign the, on most of those sorts of cases, with fishing quotas, all those sorts of things, we usually use what we call grandfathering. I don't know why it's not grandmothering, but it's grandfathering. We look at the people that are presently using, and we grant them the rights. So to an aquifer, and most of the aquifers are fairly well defined. We have an idea what's coming out of it. You would have to take each well. You'd have to estimate how much is coming out per year. And you'd give that right to that person. And so then what you would do is, again, like the fishing quotas, if it's being overexploited, you give every person a right to what they presently have. But then you might say it's going to be reduced 2% a year or 5% a year for the next 10 years. So you have an adjustment period. Uh, but I would fairly quickly try to get the, hand, the rights into the hands of individuals because, again, they're the ones with on-the-ground knowledge. They know what's going to happen. They can respond to price signals. They can consolidate. They can deconsolidate. So, yeah, I would use a, a, a method of just trying to figure out what's, who are the users. And the big users, again, are irrigation users. And some of those areas really do have metering devices already. In many parts of uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, they're using metering devices. Uh, so in that, those sorts of cases, then if you think it's being pumped down, then you either purchase those rights away, you use tax money to purchase it, or you tell people that don't like it, they can purchase it, or you actually just say, by regulation, it's going to go down a certain percentage a year till we get down to the point where we are at what we would call a rechargeable sort of a level. 
deciding who gets them is always, you know, is a difficult sort of a question. I mean, that's been one of the issues with regard to fishing quotas. You know. Somebody had left a cell phone at the check-in table, so if you are missing one, come see me afterwards. Yes, I'm from Montana also, so Great. I'm familiar with Montana, and I'm familiar with the abuses that have gone on with their rivers, the piscicides, the uh, problem with Rote Known, the problem with the Ebola uh, CDC being there, and the killing of all the animals, and this is all government issues. And this is irresponsible behavior on the part of the government, and nobody has any say as far as how mm -hmm. to resolve these problems. But my solution uh, to some of the things that you're describing here, the carbon issues are going to be resolved but by lithium batteries. Okay. We're not going to be having any, ba any more uh, carbon issues because of the problem. With the uh, lithium, it's even going to be used as far as airplanes and uh, transportation, okay. so that's going to take a lot of that carbon out of the air. My question to you is, we're getting ready for a flood season, mm -hmm. and the flood season is over here in the East Coast with all the snow. Why is it that we can't resolve that instead of looking for the government for a solution? We need more reservoirs. Yeah, it depends on where you're at, but in a lot of areas, uh, environmental pressures are such that building a reservoir just seen as a negative sort of thing. I've got a, a, a friend from California that works on water issues in California. Uh, it would make more. It would be set, make sense to have more storage reservoirs in California. They get a lot of. They get high snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas. They get a lot of runoff. It makes sense to capture some of that. He just says there will never be another reservoir built in California, because of the pressure that comes from people that think that nature should be wild and any efforts to interfere with it are immoral and changing. This kind of goes back to the balance of nature idea that humans are the cause of the problem and everything that we can do to return us back to some state of nature is a good sort of a solution. I grew up raising cows on a ranch and I must say nature isn't always benign and kind. You know, I mean, I, I sometimes think about my friends that keep talking about how great it is uh, to be out there in nature. Most of them are out there for four days uh, with ready access to get out in their, you know, um, nylon tent and their Eddie Bauer backpack. Um, you ought to try, you know, I tell them, you ought to think about an, um, a May snowstorm and you've got 80 cows out there that are birthing and those calves are falling on the ground and if a calf gets, gets, uh, gets up and sucks, he's, pro he's probably going to make it. But those first six hours are crucial. And so, uh, you know, I'm out there, it's a spring snowstorm, I'm getting soaked to the bone, I'm hauling calves in and putting tags on them and putting them in the bathtub and in the basement and then trying to go back and mother them up. And after two days of this, I'm thinking nature isn't all that kind. And those of you that tell me that it's just so great to be in this natural world haven't been in it for periods of time. But that is just part of an ethos that we ought not Everything we have right now that moves any sort of intervention with nature uh, would be seen as bad, and therefore putting up dams and using reservoirs would be, again, kind of maybe a part of the evil industrial complex. So that's not a great answer, but reservoirs, you know, storing water would certainly be a be one solution to try to to diet, try to deal with that. I would, I you know, I just think with regard to flood-prone areas. If you really want, if you think it's an information problem and people want to move into a flood prone area, then they have to go to the county courthouse and they have to sign this disclaimer that they know they are moving into it. And then you say, tough luck, you know? So they move in and their house gets flooded. You know, you know, I, first of all, I don't think the information problem is that big. But if it is that sort of an information problem and you've got all these 100 year floodplain maps, then you just simply require that people acknowledge that they want to live in particular areas. By the way, most of the population in the United States is moving to the coastal areas, which tells us either they have different information or different risk perspectives than what some people are saying with regard to the danger of flooding. So uh, I, I, I would like a mechanism that recognizes uh, people's individual initiative and individual responsibility. And if there's information problems, we try to deal with those sorts of problems. But we don't continue to subsidize activity
where people put themselves at risk and we pay for them for their taking those sorts of risks. I presume other people have asked their question. Okay, so you've got a city. Let's say it's in central Texas. Water is an issue and the carrying capacity is limited and so on. What would be the best mechanism for some local government, say a county, to appropriately limit the size of a city that might grow up in this water-limited area? Well, again, uh, I guess the question would be, if people are, if you have a water market, and people are paying for the water, for the water uh, and you have to be metering at the homes. Uh, my question is, um, why do you want to limit it? It's like, it's like a resource, and so people can decide if they move in and they're faced with the real prices. Um, I wouldn't say, now if you, if you don't use pricing, then you do end up with all sorts of strain. I mean, you have to do something to, to stop overuse of a resource, and that's the problem without property rights and prices. So if you don't have property rights and prices, I don't know, maybe you use you know, exclusionary zoning, maybe you use something, some other sort of a mechanism. But I would simply say, in Montana right now, uh, subdivisions, we are in a fully appropriated basin, uh, the Gallatin Valley Basin. All the water basically is claimed under the prior, appropri prior appropriation doctrine, which is a fairly effective property rights mechanism. Water isn't fully transferable under that, but it works pretty well. Uh, developers have to show they've got water. You know? uh, or people buying houses know that there's you know, a limited amount of water that's available. So if, if it's priced, uh, I'd put the question back to you. Um, you, know, you price the land, you price the fuel, you price you know, two by fours, you price concrete. Uh, if all those things are priced, then the local government doesn't need to think about how are we going to keep them from building because they're going to use up too many two by fours. We say, well, the market's going to communicate what's the availability of two by fours and so, you know, all those sorts of things. So uh, I would try to think about a pricing mechanism uh, that then faces people with real costs when they move in. You're going to let me off easy here. No. Repeat customer over here. Okay, good. Glad you want to kind of come at it again. Okay, I have one more question. Um, so it's interesting to me that um, you would argue that the government would be um, like maybe our best or a good solution when it comes to, um, I think it's what you call transaction costs. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, in a lot of cases, governments can be an effective lower of transaction costs. That's part of my argument. Okay. Are there examples of private um, entities, profit or not for profit, that are just as effective, if not more effective? Um, for instance, with regard to open space in a housing, in, in, with, ha with housing, uh, lots, of, lots of efforts now go into what we call planned communities, where instead of just putting up a house, a, a developer buys 30 acres and puts up a whole bunch of houses. Uh, what do they think about? Well, they think about what would people like in the way of playgrounds, what would they like in the way of paths, and so you don't need a government regulation for that. A very substantial amount of new housing is being built in what we would call planned communities. And so when you enter into that community, you're, in, you're basically entering into a contract, and, they've, and it's a permanent agreement. You know, I mean, Maybe you can change the amount of open space by a vote of the homeowners association, and that's usually a, not a simple majority, but there will be rules that say what would happen in order to make those sorts of changes. And so those are efforts that work uh, very effective. I'll put in a little plug for PERC, the Property and Environment Research Center. Uh, if you go to our webpage, it's just perk.org. We focus a lot on private conservation uh, sorts of efforts. On streams in Montana that where the rancher controls a major portion of the stream, they sell fishing rights, and they think a lot, long, and hard. I still own 240 acres on the Madison River, not quite on the river. I wouldn't be able to own to afford it, but I sold off part of my ranch. I still own 240 acres there. There's a creek that flows through it called Ray Creek. I have fenced off a portion of that creek. I'm trying to look at how much damage uh, my cattle grazing on that creek are causing in terms of stream bank damage, and what would it take in order to get fishing there? I know some neighbors with other uh, spring creeks that have 
basically increase their income. And what they've done is to fence the cattle off the streams for a major portion of the year. And that's just an effort to try to do those sorts of things. And so I would say there's all sorts of private efforts to, uh, to try to do those. And I wouldn't call common law necessarily a private effort, but it's a fairly effective mechanism. Unfortunately, statute law trumps common law. So if there's a common law cause, and there is a statute law, so you can have harm from an environmental problem, and you can say, I'm going to take that person to court under common law because of trespass or nuisance. That person can say, no, I've got a permit, and I've got a permit from the EPA. And so actually, I think that's, in some cases, has actually made uh, the, the world worse. But yeah, um, if I think a little bit more, I can think of a lot more because we write about them all the time in terms of there are private conservation efforts and a lot of people care about those sorts of things. They work hard at uh, trying to preserve the environment. So, yeah. So I think the water issue is something that we're getting more worried about. We haven't uh, there's some parts of our states that have probably been concerned, but with all the population growth, um, aquifers have been decreasing. And I, when we've had the last couple of major droughts, I was pretty thankful for Lake Waco and Lake Belton, which were these you know large reservoirs that were built, you know, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I think our state has decided to build more of those to, you know, account for the fact that the population is growing. And, and we're Texas gonna... is different than California. Yes, yeah, okay. but I, I'm I just curious, um, are, would there ever be a situation or have you seen where it would, it would be worth it for someone to take you know, their fairly unused large acreage and build a reservoir and you know, use it for selling water and then also maybe recreation or other reasons why people like our current lakes are, are used yeah. for. I don't, I've never tried to look at financials on that, but it'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't either. I don't know if water is, is valuable enough, enough yeah. to make that worthwhile. And so there is the question of what, at what price, what would water have to get, price it would get to, uh, to try to get there. But By the way, one other thing, for those of you that are students, uh, PERC does an undergraduate student seminar, seminar called Free Market Environmentalism in June. If you go to perk.org, uh, you can apply, and we will bring in 24 or 25 students and give you the whole schmear in about five days. Plus, we'll give you a day off to go hiking or rafting or something. So, so but yeah, good, good question, Steve, and I just don't know. Uh, I assume part of it is that you know, water is just priced so low right now that we just waste it in all sorts of ways. And then we get concerned because you know, we're, we're running out. People have done, you know, estimates on the price elasticity of water, and it's kind of a regular sort of a normal good in which, you know, the price goes up by 10% and people cut their water consumption by, you know, by 4%. So we're not talking about huge increases in prices to get substantial changes in behavior. But that would be an interesting question. What, what would the price of water have to be in order for it to be, um, you know, for a private individual to basically to, to try to sell it? Thank you for the uh, talk that you gave us this afternoon. Uh, I have a question about an update on Boone Pickens uh, and his water. Am I too loud? Okay. Well, you're not loud enough. <laughs> oh, I'm not loud enough. Okay, I didn't want to blast you out. Uh, Boone Pickens uh, and his purchase of water in West Texas, the Ogala, and selling it to Fort Worth and Dallas. And uh, I always thought our Texas law was that you got the deepest straw in the ground, then you get your water. Yeah. I must say, I don't know. Okay. I, you know, my only experience with Boone Pickens was sitting by his wife at a dinner, at a dinner event that uh, Perk did, and I was sitting by his wife, and I discovered uh, it's inappropriate. I was just trying to make conversation, so I asked his wife, it was his second or third wife, and I said, well, you know, how old are your children? She says, oh, no, you're trying to figure out how old I am. And I wasn't trying to figure that out at all, but I clearly created a, a faux pas with uh, Mrs. Pickens. So my only experience with that. But no, I don't know the status of Texas water law and what he's doing. There have been several people that have bet pretty heavily on investing in water for water markets. Many times, then, legally, it hasn't worked out that it is as fully transferable as they hoped. So there are some investment firms that have decided water would be something to invest in, 
But what the hope is that it's going to be transferable. And if it's not, then you run into, into problems. So I don't know. I have time for just one more question. I'd like to know what your opinion is about Agenda 21. Uh, it, it covers a lot about water rights. It covers a lot about redistricting and rebuilding the uh, society along water areas and uh, property rights not, and being government controlled as a result. Is it a federal program, a state-based program? I don't know what Agenda 21 is. I must confess, I don't know. Uh, it's a combination, uh, United Nations. Okay. Well, the, the, the larger you get, the, the, the higher you go in terms of the chain of command, the less likely it is going to be able to respond to situations on the ground. So I would be, uh, you know, I would say that you only ought to go to those levels for which the transaction costs are really, really high for locals to solve the sorts of problems. So I like federalism. I like solutions that go down below federal, the federal level. And so that's where I would try to go with most of those sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <clears throat>